we need massive legal changes and we need a discussion about consent. Yeah, it's too late. Me. Late jokes, period checks, and rumors of sexual violence and harassment perpetrated by high profile Malaysian figures have resulted in public outrage and furious responses on social media. Hello, my name is Hazem Ashraf and I am coming to you live from the Legal Talks. Welcome to today's webinar in which throughout the session we will be getting questions from our viewers in regards to today's talk on rape in Malaysia. As our country confronts rape in schools and conservative norms are being scrutinized, we explore this topic from a legal perspective to discuss the areas of the law of faith in Malaysia which needs to be improved on and proposals for reform. Joining me today we have Yuan Wei Chi, Joey Tan Turn Singh, Hu Tua Iyo, and last but not least, Tan Ka Leong Kliangin. However, before we go into today's discussion, one needs to know the definition of rape. Rape is dealt with under Section 375 of the Malaysian Penal Code. Under Section 375, a man is said to commit rape who, except in the case hereinafter accepted, has sexual intercourse with a woman under the circumstances falling under any of the following descriptions as stated in Section 375A to G. However, an exception exists under Section 375 where Malaysian law currently explicitly permits marriage of rape. Now, this is exactly what happened in the case of 60-year-old Nilambika, whose husband repeatedly raped her after she decided to end their marriage. When is it going to stop, she asks. To talk more on this, we have Yuan Reich. Thank you, Ashraf. Well, rape is a punishable offence under Section 375 of the Penal Code. The exception under the same provision provides that marital rape is not. Unfortunately, this marital rape immunity does not provide justice for a wife who has been forced into sexual intercourse against her will or without her consent. In response to the criticisms leveled against the marital rape immunity, Section 375A was enacted in hopes to remedy the gap in Section 375. However, upon closer scrutiny, there are three core distinctions between these provisions which show that Section 375A fails to address the concerns of marital rape immunity. Firstly, under Section 375A, a husband is not punished for having unconsented sexual intercourse with his wife. Rather, as the provision reads, a hus the husband is punished for causing or threatening hurt in order to have sexual intercourse with his wife. You might think that a husband having sexual intercourse with his wife without her consent is equivalent to hurt. However, this is not the case. What Section 375A requires is the finding of hurt over and above the act of sexual intercourse itself, which was so caused in order to have sexual intercourse. Therefore, Section 375A punishes a husband for the threat or injury that he has caused, but not for the sexual intercourse that he has forced. Secondly, Section 375A negates the significance of consensual sexual intercourse. Unlike Section 375 which criminalizes rape against a woman's consent, the element of consent is silent under Section 375A. We submit that this fails to recognize that rape is possible even without causing or threatening hurt. Consider this. What if a husband has sexual intercourse with his wife who is intoxicated and became too incapacitated to consent? The answer is that he is not guilty because Section 375A disregards the issue of consent and there was no finding of him causing or threatening hurt. Clearly, he is also protected by the marital rape immunity. Finally, he walks away as a free man and his wife is left with no avail. Thirdly, whilst the offence of rape provides for imprisonment up to 20 years, the punishment for Section 375A is far more lenient with its imprisonment term being merely up to 5 years. Moreover, there is no minimum imprisonment term under Section 375A and this means that convicted persons may get away with light sentences. On one hand, Article 8 of the Federal Constitution provides for equality and equal protection to all before the law. 
Yet, on the other hand, the exception under Section 375 clearly discriminates against the rights of married women by conferring them a lower level of protection than unmarried women. Well, we have our first question for today. How is the law on marriage rape treated in other jurisdictions? In reference to other Commonwealth jurisdictions, the English case of Argens are abolished the marital rape immunity, specifying that the idea that a wife consents to sexual intercourse upon marriage is now a bygone common law fiction. Likewise, Canada's Bill C-127 came into effect to achieve formal equality of personhood between wives and non-wives, and this effectively criminalized marital rape. Just two years ago, our neighbour Singapore celebrated its victory over the repeal of the marital rape immunity as its criminal law reform bill was passed. International and local organisations such as the CEDAW, SUHAKAM and WAO had also repeatedly pushed for the amendments of the penal code to criminalise marital rape. All in all, the exception under Section 375 now permits marital rape and neither the Section 375A confers sufficient protection to its victims of marital rape. Therefore, we propose a reform of the penal code to remove the exception under Section 375 to criminalise marital rape entirely. In the words of a survivor of marital rape, something died inside of me. On top of the fact that rape is in itself a despicable act, marital rape can be the most traumatic form of rape entailing a sense of betrayal by one's own spouse. And this is even more so where the act is committed repeatedly throughout the marriage. Marriage is not a license to rape. A woman's body is her own and even if she is your wife, she is entitled to say no. And no means no. Thank you for that, Yuri Chi. Now, moving on. A Chinese language media reports a 60-year-old's conviction was overturned by the Court of Appeal because he said he had used a finger tainted with his semen to penetrate a 15-year-old girl. Now, to discuss more on the related law on this, please help me welcome Utra Io. Thank you, Ashraf. Our current law does not recognize non-consensual penetration by body parts other than the penis, objects, anal and oral intercourse as amounting to rape. Here, I will discuss two issues. Now, the first issue is that non-consensual penetration orally or anally does not amount to rape. In the current law, according to Section 375, rape is only committed when there is non-consensual vaginal penetration and does not include anal or oral penetration. Instead, Section 377A provides that anal or oral intercourse is a crime that is called carnal intercourse against the order of nature. In addition, Section 377C criminalizes anal or oral intercourse that occurred without consent, against the will of the other person, or that puts the other person in fear of death or hurt. Moving on, the second issue is that non-consensual penetration by objects or body parts such as fingers does not amount to rape. As Ashraf mentioned earlier, in the case of Bunya Anat Jalong in 2015, which involved the perpetrator impregnating the victim by penetrating her with his fingers which were laden with semen, the perpetrator was acquitted of all charges because the definition of rape only included penal introduction into the vagina. In response to the public outrage over the acquittal, the amendment to Section 377CA in 2017 criminalised a sexual connection with another person through the introduction of an object or body parts other than the penis into the vagina or anus of another without consent. So, now that we understand these two issues, a proposal for reform, which I do believe will help our country, is that Malaysia should include non-consensual oral and anal intercourse and penetration by objects or body parts other than the penis under Section 375 so that it amounts to rape. 
Now, although the Penal Code does criminalize these acts, a perpetrator who is charged under Section 377C or 377CA instead of being charged with rape under Section 375 does not carry the heavy connotations that are attached with the crime of rape. Instead, the fact that these non-consensual acts do not constitute as rape trivializes the severity of the crime. Rape is rape and it is severe whether or not the victim was penetrated vaginally, orally, anally or penetrated with an object or a body part other than the penis. Moreover, these acts should come under Section 375 to constitute as rape so that Malaysia's rape laws become easier to understand as all of it are uniformly covered by Section 375 instead of being covered in multiple sections. I see. Now, Utva, we have a question from the audience. Are abortions to terminate pregnancies as a result of rape? illegal in Malaysia? Thank you, Ashraf, for that question. Now, Section 312 criminalizes the act of voluntarily causing a woman with child or a woman quick with child to miscarry. However, this section does not extend to a registered medical practitioner who terminates the pregnancy if he is of the opinion formed in good faith that the continuance of the pregnancy would involve a risk to the life of the pregnant woman or injury to the mental or physical health of the pregnant woman. Now the issue with section 312 is that it is ambiguous about what amounts to physical or mental injury. To this date, there have been no decided cases in Malaysia that can be referred to when ascertaining the meaning and extent of physical or mental injury that is required to permit a legal abortion for a pregnancy caused by rape. Therefore, Malaysia should take inspiration from Section 3 of India's Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act 1971, which allows for abortions of pregnancies caused by rape. As such, a proposal for reform is that a specific provision should be inserted pertaining to the termination of pregnancies caused by rape or non-consensual acts such as in the case of Bunya Ana Jalong so that rape victims are not left with an unwanted child. Thank you very much, Uthra, for that interesting take. Well, just a few months ago, the world was horrified by the news of Reina Sinaga, said to be the world's most prolific rapist in British history, with 159 counts of sexual offences against 48 men. Like everywhere else around the world, male rape is a taboo in Southeast Asia, including Malaysia. More on this, we have Joey. Thank you, Ashraf. The current law on rape under Section 375 of the Penal Code expressly identifies the man as the offender and the woman as the victim. It is entirely gender delineated and this needs to change. The Indian court in the case of Sudesh Jakku against KCJ and others opined that rape should be regarded as a gender neutral crime rather than just a crime against women. According to the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey 2010, approximately one in every 21 men disclose that they have been forced to penetrate an individual. Among these numbers, 79.2% reported the offender being a female. In another study conducted by CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 86.5% male victims reported that the offenders were male. In these cases, the male victim is forced to penetrate, which means the victim is forced to penetrate the offender's vagina, anus or mouth without his consent or against his will. Although the male victim is indeed the penetrator in cases as such, the sexual act took place without his consent. Hence, the victim's own penis is being used as a weapon against himself rather than by himself. Amendments must be made to include forced to penetrate cases under the ambit of rape as there are significant similarities between them. Firstly, 
Both rape cases and forced to penetrate cases involve non-consensual penal to vaginal or anal or oral penetration. Secondly, similarities can also be found in the aggressive strategies and brutal conducts used by offenders to commit the rape. However, critics have contended that male victims suffer less of an assault on bodily autonomy and integrity as they are the penetrator and not the one being penetrated. We submit that this contention failed to recognize the agony suffered by these male victims. The Malaysian Medical Association president, Dr. Tamasilan, asserted that it is possible for male victims to suffer greater psychological damage as they are pressured to suffer in silence due to society's reluctance to accept their victimization. Although a man being forced to penetrate does not carry the risk of an unwanted pregnancy, there is still a possibility of the male victim fathering an unwanted child with the offender. Not to mention, such unconsented penetration also places the male victim at risk of contracting sexually transmitted disease. Hence, there is a dire need to amend Section 375 as it does not provide for rape against men. Instead of the subtle differences in relation to gender, the significant similarities between rape cases and forced to penetrate cases should be focused upon to ensure that all victims receive the same level of protection under the law. I see. Well, Joey, what do you think can be done in Malaysia to tackle this issue? Thank you, Ashraf. We propose to replace the word men and women in Section 375 with a non-gender biased term, person. Similarly, we propose to replace the word her under Section 375 subsection A to G with a person. This proposal is supported by statutes and case laws from other jurisdictions. For instance, the Supreme Court of Victoria in Crown against Cockley held that whether the victim was a man or a woman or a person who had the physical appearance or attributes of a man or a woman is not relevant in determining whether the offence of assault with intent to rape was committed. Moreover, Article 222-23 to of the French Penal Code defines rape as any act of sexual penetration of any nature committed on another person by violence, constraint, threat or surprise, making rape a non-gender biased offence. Closer to home, the Singaporean Criminal Law Reform Act 2019 expanded the definition of rape to regard men as victims of rape and voyeurism. Additionally, Section 2 of the Philippines Republic Act has classified rape as a crime against persons, making rape a non-gender biased offence. In light of the above, we assert that the law on rape is not only concerned with the protection of virginity, but it also seeks to safeguard the modesty and dignity of a person. Hence, it is not pertinent to determine whether the victim or offender was a man or a woman. The relevant matter should be whether a crime has been committed or not. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. We will now shift the discussion to the law of statutory rape, in which a person can have said to have committed rape even if consent was given. Tan Kalyo Kianu will now be discussing more on this topic. Thank you, Ashraf. Statutory rape is defined as the non forcible section of the course with a woman who is below the age of consent. The law seeks to protect young females from being taken advantage of by legally nullifying their ability to consent to sexual intercourse, as the law views them as lacking the experiences to make mature and informed decisions. Moreover, they are also less likely to understand and consider the potential consequences of sexual intercourse, such as sexually transmitted diseases, pregnancies, and the potential harm to their sexual organs that are not fully developed. Unlike the conventional rape offence, the essence of statutory rape is the age of the victim and not the absence of consent. While the statutory age of consent differs from a country to another, Section 375 sub G of the Malaysian Penal Code sets it at 16 years old. However, the statutory age of consent has been blurred by the introduction of the Sexual Offences Against Children Act 2017. This is because the Act is introduced to address sexual offences committed against children under the age of 18 years old. And Section 14 of the Act provides for the offence of physical sexual assault, which includes but are not limited to touching any part of the body of a child for sexual purposes. Therefore, a man may still commit a crime if he has consensual sexual intercourse with a woman above the age of 16 years but under the age of 18 years. 
Although the Act is silent on consent, it can be assumed that consent is not a defence under this Act, as children are generally deemed incapable of consenting in law. This is consistent with the definition of child under the Child Act 2001, where a child is defined as a person under the age of 18 years old. Moreover, the Age of Majority Act 1971 also provides that every person within Malaysia shall be at the age of majority when they reach 18 years old. Since the punishment for the offence of sexual assault carries the same weight for the offence of statutory rape under Section 376 Sub 1 of the Penal Code, would this therefore mean that the age of consent is technically 18 years old and not 16 years old? Such inconsistency in the law is a grey area which requires clarification and standardization, as the rule of law requires the law to be clear so that people can live and plan out their lives accordingly to the framework of the law. This will also prevent a man from unintentionally committing a crime when he engages in consensual sexual intercourse with his partner, as statistics from the 2014 study show that more than 50% of statutory rape cases is committed by the mutual consent of the offender and the victim. Interesting. Speaking of punishment, would a teenage boy who is in a romantic relationship with a teenage girl be subjected to the same punishment if he has consensual sexual intercourse with the girl even though they are of the same age or a few years different? That's a very good question, Ashra. As this highlights the other aspect that is also unsatisfactory on the current law of statutory rape. This is because the law treats all offenders to be rapists without distinguishing consensual cases involving teenagers who are close in age, and cases where the offender is an adult predator that seeks to take advantage of younger women. It is submitted that such a strict liability rule should be relaxed by including a close in age exemption, which prevents the prosecution of individuals who engages in consensual sexual intercourse with a woman below the age of consent, when both participants are significantly close in age to each other. A fine example can be seen in the Criminal Code of Canada, where Section 150.1 sub 2 provides that a 12 or 13 year old may consent to sexual activity with a partner that is less than two years older. Whereas Section 150.1 sub 2.1 provides that a 14 or 15 year old may consent to sexual activity with a partner that is less than 5 years older. Such provisions are satisfactory as it recognizes that the level of maturity of a 12 year old will be different from a 15 year old. Thus, reforms should be made to the penal code to include a close in age exemption with necessary adjustment made to reflect an acceptable range for the norm of Malaysian society. It is suggested that the age range in Malaysia should be where a 12 to 14 year old girl may consent to sexual intercourse with a partner that is less than 2 years older, whereas a 15 to 16 year old girl may consent with a partner that is less than 3 years older. The law may also combine a lighter sentence for offenders that falls within the close in age exemption to reflect the element of deterrence, such as the court's power to grant a good behaviour bond under Section 294 of the Criminal Procedure Code, which have been amended away by the Criminal Procedure Code Amendment Act 2016. Well, a viewer from the audience asks, wouldn't allowing the court to grant a good behaviour bond lead to some controversial results? as in the case of Noor Afiza, Azizan, and public prosecutor? Thank you for the question. The answer to that question would be a no, as the reform that we are currently suggesting combines the lighter sentence with the close in age exemption. Therefore, by using the case of Nora Afizal Azizan against public prosecutor as an example, the age gap between the 19-year-old offender and the 13-year-old victim would be too wide to fall under the close in age exemption to allow the court to grant a good behaviour bond. Now, although a possible criticism for introducing such a reform would be that it is akin to lowering the age of statutory rape, it is opined that such a sentence would be more favourable, as mandatory imprisonment would not be suitable for teenagers in which their consensual sexual relationship was driven by their adolescent sexuality and curiosity. Most importantly, it also enforces society's moral condemnation of the behaviour, while ensuring that the least culpable individual do not receive excessive punishment by distinguishing young lovers from adult sexual predators. In all, the topic of rape has been one which has haunted this country for decades. As mentioned by the speakers, the following reforms should be in place. Firstly, 
the penal code should remove the exception under Section 375 to criminalize marital rape entirely, as stated by Yuan Weiqi. Secondly, Malaysia should include non-consensual or an anal intercourse and penetration by objects or body parts other than the penis under Section 375 to constitute as rape, which could also lead to uniformity. Uthra further mentioned that a specific provision should be inserted pertaining to the termination of pregnancies caused by rape or non-consensual acts. Thirdly, as stated by Joey, to replace the word man and woman in Section 375 with a non-gender biased term, person, and to do the same in Section 375A, 2G, by replacing her with person. Lastly, as stated by Keanu, the penal code should include a close-in-age exemption with necessary adjustments made to reflect an acceptable age range for the norm of Malaysian society. However, the problem lies not in the hands of an individual or a few misogynistic men, but in society as a whole. It lies in the mindset of the people and every one of us taking part in rape culture by endorsing rape myths. If you are a victim or know someone who requires assistance, please fill in the following. Thank you very much for tuning into the Legal Talks today.